I was first asked to do this talk. I've always been terrified of public speaking, so it's really blowing my mind that I'm doing this, that I'm standing up here right now. And it is, it is terrifying, but it's also it's exciting. So what I will be talking about uh, today are the importance of working by hand, experimentation and making mistakes, claiming time for creative pursuits, and changing the perception of what you are capable of. Making comes in many different forms, but for the purposes of this talk, I will emphasize working by hand, simply because for many of us, this way of working is missing from our lives. My goal for the end of the talk uh, is to get everyone here inspired to go out and make something with their hands. So, how many people here make things by hand? Put up your hand. Oh, awesome. And how many people here consider themselves a maker? Okay, smaller number. So I am a self-taught artist, but I also like to use the term maker to describe myself. I create many different types of work because the core of what I am is an experimenter and explorer. I follow ideas, I, I play with materials, and I try new things constantly, as you can see, giraffe head. Uh, I'm the kind of person who is always itching to create and make. My development as an artist has followed a very non-linear path through many different mediums. I've done everything from photography to murals made of yarn uh, and paper engineering. At home, I'm dabbling with sewing, and someday I would love to try things like wood carving and uh, restoring secondhand furniture. What I've found is that making leads to more making. So, as Mark said, uh, four or five years ago, I had no idea I could do any of the work that I do now, quite simply because I'd never tried before. For the longest time, I convinced myself that I was just a photographer, and this was the end of the story for me. Um, I taught myself everything through experiential learning and have come to realize uh, the more different types of hands-on learning that we do, the more we are capable of learning and doing, because all of our skills are interconnected. So working with my hands engages my brain in different ways because it connects the mental functions with the physical process. Human beings are physical, tactile creatures. Uh, we need to move our bodies and use our hands for more than just typing or pushing a mouse around in order to fully engage our brains. I've unearthed uh, many hidden skills and talents through hands-on making. And I think everyone here uh, has the same untapped potential that a shift in perception could unlock. We are all creative, we are all makers. And as you can see from this illustration, your brain is really happy when you're making. <laughs> So, photography was my singular focus for 16 years. 
And film and manual cameras were the tools of my trade. I've always been very passionate about photography. So it's a little sad uh, to realize these days I, I hardly take photos, to be honest. And my main camera now is an iPhone. Uh, I often refer to myself as a lapsed photographer. Uh, it's kind of like being a lapsed Catholic, but <laughs> slightly less guilt. Uh, and also pictured here, more paper craft costumes that I've made paper handlers. So my shift away from photography began around the time my primary camera became a digital camera. And uh, producing my work completely centered around uh, a, a computer. This includes the work that I did in the day job that I was doing at the time. If you come from a background of film photography as I do, I think you can relate more strongly to this idea. Uh, there were more physical elements to photography in the form of film to insert into a camera, uh, negatives to look at, and prints to handle as an end result. I recognized by going completely digital, it was too much of a limited range of activity and I wasn't stimulated enough on some level. So I felt this desire for a hands-on process. So in order to satisfy this, I started dabbling with collage using pretty basic materials like scrap paper and images cut from magazines. You know, pictured here, there's the beginnings of what I was doing. Um, so of all the work I do, I feel like this is the least significant, interesting, or original, but doing collage was an important first step that led to every other type of hands-on making that came after, simply because it was hands-on making. Uh, I don't think most of what I created at this time was very good, honestly, but it, it didn't matter because I was doing it for enjoyment. Uh, for its own sake, without worrying about what the end result was for, uh, and allowing myself to play. A sense of play is important to experimenting and making, because in play we maintain uh, this sense of curiosity and we keep an open mind. <coughs> so with each new process, I started to recognize I would often begin a piece of work in a place of fear and hesitation rather than play. I would worry about making a mistake uh, or about ruining the materials I wanted to work with or even wondering at the beginning whether or not the end result would be good. And I recognize this fear in other people when I teach workshops. Uh, I think we really have this unrealistic expectation that everything we make should be good and perfect, even uh, when we're learning something new. And it's really just a ridiculous expectation to have. But every type of making is about stumbling through a lack of skill, uh, imperfection, and even sometimes failure. Because not everything is going to work out, especially when you're learning something new. But the thing is, you have to keep at it in order to improve and get better. It should be a given that we all have to create a certain amount of crappy work and make mistakes uh, in order to achieve the really good stuff. So what you should do is embrace the crappy work because it's an important part of the process. It's a reflection of your development as a, a maker, an artist, a crafter, designer, even a chef, whatever you choose to be, whatever you choose to call yourself. Mistakes and failure are important because they are opportunities for learning and they should not be avoided. So from collage came altered bookwork and working with paper. And so pictured here, this is the first altered book I ever created. And Looking back, I don't love it. Um, but there you go, you gotta start somewhere. Um, so I'd had this idea for years about working with books to create art, which as a photographer, I could not figure out how to do. Uh, so spending time on collage unlocked this idea finally 
for me because I'd gone through this process of developing the skills I, I needed to finally figure out how to make it happen. And I call this, this idea leveling up. Uh, it's kind of like in a video game where you collect objects or fight the bad guys, but with less first person shooting. And although I don't really know what I'm talking about when it comes to video games, because I don't really know. Uh, when you spend time developing skills in a certain area, it can lead to unlocking yet more skills you've previously untapped because they are often interconnected. Momentary pause for water. So to explain, altered books are three-dimensional collage using old books as a canvas. I discovered this was a thing when I came across a book called New Directions in Altered Books by Gabe Sear. Uh, this book really exploded my brain. Making altered books, and, and making altered books became this favorite thing that I was suddenly completely obsessed with. And this was around September 2009 when I started this. Uh, and within four months of that time, uh, beginning these explorations, I had produced uh, 10 book sculptures. And it was really astonishing to me that I could create work like this because it was so far beyond what I had previously led myself to believe that I could do. It was, for me, a new approach to art making that took me further into connecting with untapped skills. So photography is a great way to develop your eye and learn about composition, but Alter Books is about thinking about composition in terms of three dimensions instead of two. Also, I was creating from this place of play because much of the work was developed through spontaneous process. And, and also there's a lot of problem solving involved in working with uh, three-dimensional objects. So as an artist, I have followed this nonlinear path, uh, driven by a need to experiment, explore, and grow, and in the process discovered the work that I am very passionate about. The creative path, just like the path you follow in life, uh, is full of random moments that have this potential to send you in different directions depending on your choices. And I think it's important to acknowledge that sometimes people stumble onto things they are good at by accident rather than by intention, which is why it's important to put aside assumptions and stay open to different possibilities. So most of what I do is driven by personal projects rather than client projects, but I realize I've grown more as an artist because of external projects and certain interesting opportunities that have come my way over the years. So the following are three projects I feel were significant in some way to my development as an artist. So I was asked to create tree-themed art for an office a couple of years ago. Uh, which is how I started making what are called yarn mules. I came across this idea on the internet. It's not my original idea. You know, the internet's a great resource for finding all sorts of things. And I wanted to try this out partly because it has a very low material cost uh, involved with it, but mostly because it's just really cool looking. I had complete creative freedom with this project, and I approached it as an experiment to try something new. Uh, so my perception is that I cannot draw very well. This is often something that people say, that I cannot draw. But drawing and painting are things I used to be pretty okay at as a, a teenager, which was a long time ago. But I've lost these skills over time because I've neglected them. But by changing the process and tools of drawing, I was able to push past this perception. My discovery from doing this project was to realize I can actually draw when it comes to things like push pins and yarn. Or in the case of the paper cutting work, I can draw with a knife. Uh, the end result for this was that I was able to create an interesting 
piece of work in the form of a big, beautiful tree, part of which you can see here, and adds this idea of doing yarn murals to the list of work that I can offer to people. So forcing yourself to experiment with a new process, it can help you break through these perceptions of your limitations of your abilities. So this is a short time lapse uh, taken of me last year working on a yarn mural for a friend. It was shot and edited by Lee Lefebvre. And the uh, special distracting guest dog is, that's Bosco. And he was, of course, integral to the process. It's important to have a dog monitor you while you work. <laughs> so, my skills in paper engineering, uh, these were developed because of a, an interesting client request that came my way uh, sometime last year. I was asked by Giant Ant, they're a local creative firm that does a lot of um, film and animation work and they're an awesome team of people. So they asked me to create a set of uh, 10 full-scale musical instruments uh, from paper and this was for a music video shoot that they were doing for uh, Current Swell, a, Victor a band from Victoria. So I've always wondered why they asked me to do this project, because I had no previous experience uh, making books from paper. And I suspect actually that they asked me just because I'm the only person they could think of who worked with paper, which is fine. Um, so my initial reaction to this project was fear, uncertainty, lots of anxiety. I, I really wanted to do this project, but I was intimidated uh, because it just seemed really huge and beyond my abilities and like how the hell do you make paper instruments? But I realized once I got past those feelings, I I I've already begun doing a lot of the work in my head even before this project started. And actually that's how the giraffe came about because I was figuring out how to make three-dimensional things with paper. Uh, so my mind was busy solving the problem of how to work in three dimensions and I realized I could design things in my head and just move directly to making them. So this was a scale I'd never before kind of engaged. So it was this fantastic trial by fire learning experience and one I'm very glad that I said yes to doing instead of no and letting the fear take over. And I encourage everyone here to do those things that scare you, like public speaking, because they push you to move outside of your comfort zone and, and it forces you to grow. This is because the scary and new stuff, it drives learning and growth in a larger way than personal goals can on their own. And sometimes these opportunities present themselves in different ways, so it's really important to recognize when to say yes instead of no. Although, really, you shouldn't say yes to everything. Um, and pictured here is the uh, instruments on set. And uh, sadly, part of this whole project was that they destroyed the instruments by the end of the, the, the video. <laughs> Which I was okay with because it's client. <coughs> <laughs> Gotta let go of client work. <laughs> so, the paper cutting work I'm currently focused on came about because of my participation in the Sketchbook Project 2012. And I hope at least some people have heard of this because it's a great, it's a great art project. So, this is a collaborative art project based in Brooklyn. It's run by Art House Co-op. So what you do is you sign up online, they send you a blank sketchbook, it's about five by seven, something like that, and you do whatever you want within the sketchbook, it's totally up to you, and then when you're finished with it, you donate it back to their collection, and their collection is amazing. So I chose to use my sketchbook to play and not worry about the results. There's a lot of play in what I do. Uh, in, and in doing so, I stumbled upon this repetitive paper cutting work that is now the focus of my work. 
So unexpectedly, taking part in a tiny little project like the Sketchbook Project was a significant aha moment for me that's driven the work I've been doing for the last two years. And I'm not really sure how I would have discovered my passion for paper cutting without this project. So I think if you're looking for a way to get inspired, I highly recommend checking out the Sketchbook Project and taking part. And a great thing about the Sketchbook Project is that uh, they actually tour the sketchbooks and they'll be bringing them to Vancouver sometime next year. So check it out. So these are some examples of my most recent work. I've come a long way in terms of development and refinement since the work I created for the Sketchbook Project, because I've really worked hard at it. Uh, to me, this was an important lesson in valuing those small projects as much as the larger ones. Um, because significant ideas can come when you give yourself this time to play. People are often interested in how I produce the, the paper cut work, so this is a time lapse of me working on a small piece, and it's about an hour's worth of work. Uh, I create work through spontaneous process, as I said. I, I don't draw or design any of it other than with a knife, and I let the work develop as I go along, and I find it's a very meditative way of working. And when I first watched this time lapse, I was really amazed that I didn't cut my finger and chop my finger. Because there's lots of fingers and knives flying around. And this is actually the finished piece. So that's the size of it. So inspiration for my artwork comes from many sources, mostly through the process of making and the materials I work with. But I also get inspired by seeing what other artists are creating, especially those working at a, a much higher level than I am. This is where the emerging comes in. Uh, by looking at work at a higher level, it gives us something to aspire towards and motivate better work from ourselves especially when we see, see stuff that seems far beyond our current abilities. There are many artists I thought about sharing with you guys, um, but I decided to go with a few people that I've, I've actually seen their work in person instead of just on the internet. So these are three artists that I find very inspiring. So the first is Cal Lane. She's a Canadian artist. I first encountered her work at Grunt Gallery this past February. She creates her work by using a plasma torch to cut these beautiful, elaborate designs um, from reclaimed metal objects like shipping containers, oil drums, and in this case, a drainage pipe. So her work, to me, is paper cutting on a larger scale, and I aspire to do crazy, huge paper cutting work on this scale someday. Uh, Ruth Asawa is a, she's a sculptor and she's really well known for her public art pieces. Most of them are based in San Francisco. And also these crocheted wire sculptures, which are absolutely stunning. I came across her work uh, at the De Young Museum in San Francisco about six or seven years ago. And I saw it again recently in San Francisco. It's, it's really beautiful stuff. I, I'm really drawn to the organic forms she creates, but also to how these pieces play with lights and cast interesting shadows. And the beautiful thing about this image, uh, it's hard to tell what are the pieces and what are the shadows, but it is actually a mix of real pieces and shadows. And Irving Harper. I, I love him, he's amazing. Uh, he is a noted industrial designer recognized for his iconic Herman Miller furniture designs. So what the work I'm showing here uh, are some of the paperworks he's created in his spare time 
over a 50 year period and he did this as a way to relieve stress from his job. And to me he demonstrates that paper is a versatile medium and someday I, I hope to have a home filled with these beautiful handmade objects as his seems to be. And if you Google Irving Harper, uh, there's this fantastic video of a tour of his home showing all these amazing objects that he's made. So now, think about all those things you've always wanted to try but have never given yourself the time or permission to do. Take a moment. I think everyone has a mental list of things that they'd like to do someday. But what if you actually gave yourself uh, permission to do them now, or rather, not right now, maybe on the weekend, but instead of continuing to put it off indefinitely, often I find that the convenient someday, it never comes unless we make it a priority and dedicate the time. I am a full-time artist today because I made the decision years ago to put art at, uh, put art and making closer to the top of my priorities list instead of towards the bottom. It, and it's not about whether or not you have the time, it's about making the time. And so there are two ways I've managed to accomplish this. Uh, one was to carve out a regular time slot in my schedule. A single day a week that was completely dedicated to making art and not let anything else encroach on that time. No coffee dates, no laundry, no nothing. And the second way was to come up with goals or projects with very specific deadlines to keep myself making on a regular basis. And this is despite a lack of time and whether or not I felt inspired. Sometimes we just have to show up and do the work to get inspired. So over the past five years, I've shown myself I can do more than I'd assumed I was capable of. And that development continues to this day. I realize uh, the importance of being committed to lifelong learning. I, I constantly surprise myself with what I can do, which is a surprise in itself because I'd always assumed incorrectly, people are less capable of learning new things as we get older. And this is yet another realization of how we set limitations on ourselves through mistaken assumptions and, and misperceptions. So to close, here is a, a great quote from designer and artist uh, Debbie Millman that I came across. She has a great podcast called Design Matters that I highly recommend. And in the quote she says, John Maida once explained, the computer will do anything within its abilities, but it will do nothing unless commanded to do so. I think people are the same. We like to operate within our abilities, but whereas the computer has a fixed code, our abilities are limited only by our perceptions. So I encourage you to change the perception of where your limitations lie, to work more often with your hands, experiment and play with new things, embrace your mistakes, and above all, claim time for making. Thank you. Good, so I'll ask you one. Rach, being the first Creative Mornings volunteer on our stage and a notorious volunteer community, um, engaged community person yourself, why do you do that? And, and, do, you, and like, do you venture, you do some things outside of the art community, right? So what, why, what, what motivates you to do that stuff? We won't have a creative community unless we all step up and make things happen. Like a lot of the stuff we have, we have because of individuals like Mark 
Bussy and all the volunteers that are part of Creative Mornings. You know, it's all people just putting their time in. So I see those examples. You know, Mark is very much an influencer for me in that respect, and also my partner, Boris Mann. These are people that decide to step up and do things, and so it's important for me to not just attend things, but also to make them happen. So, in order to the yeah, question was not a plan to make you point to me. <laughs> no, but I just I do want to acknowledge that Mark does Sorry. a lot of stuff and okay, I'll shut up. So okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, question you went from film uh, to digital and kinda of sounded like you kinda of lost your soul in digital. Um, and you know, you can change those words. Uh, and then and then you missed the tactile feel of the film. And that led to other discoveries and what you're doing now. Uh, so that's that's cool. Um, back to film? Why not back to film? Um, what? Like, just comments on that. I, not, I mean, on that transition and like the whole transition from. Well, just just like, well, like it, you didn't it go back. Actually, uh, I guess the way it sounds in the presentation, it sounds like. It's just the sudden thing, but it was actually a, a long, gradual trans transition. Um, when I was starting to do the collage, I was still doing a lot of photography, um, a lot of project-based photography, so these things were all going on in parallel. So when I was um, doing the altered books, more so than the collage, I was doing these series of altered books, but also doing a series of um, portraits at the same time. So the the all the um, women portraits that came up when I was talking about that, that was the series that I was working on at that same time. So it wasn't like I started doing collage and then photography was dead to me. They 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 continued in parallel. But will you go back to film? I Maybe eventually. Uh, I do miss doing photography, but I don't feel the drive for it right now. But I, I'm leaving that door open. But it is, I do acknowledge it is harder to find film to shoot. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, your cutting seems so perfect. <laughs> I've tried many, many times, and then you get these little jagged edges. I just wonder how long it took you to make them look. They just are so clean and so beautiful. Did that take a really long time to get that gesture right? I've, I've been doing it for just under two years. Um, it's hard for me to say. I, I think it came pretty naturally to me, uh, but there has been a lot of um, like developing the fine motor skills to actually do it. An important part of it is uh, the right paper choices and making sure that you have a fresh blade. Yeah, I change my blade a lot. Um, if I'm working on like a large piece, I maybe change it every half an hour. It, yeah, you're changing it a lot. Because as soon as it gets dull, then you get it gets caught in the paper or you'll rip the paper. Uh, hi, this is a kind of a follow-up question, and I was wondering, in your creative process, how do you know when you've made a mistake? Like, it might be obvious, like, everything works apart, but are there other times when you suddenly become aware you've made a mistake? And also, what do you do when you've made a mistake? Do you embrace it, or do you start over? Well, with the paper cutting, sometimes the mistakes are, you know, from not having a sharp enough blade, and uh, not being really careful and suddenly I've cut something I didn't mean to cut and uh, a lot of people ask like what do you what do you do if that happens do you just throw it away and like of course not it's a lot of work to get to that point so I have repair tape that I can fix it with. Um, but uh, I've a mistake I recently made was uh, having an almost complete uh, piece of paper cut work that I, because I had it on the floor in a stupid spot, I ended up dripping ink on it 
because I was working on something else at the same time, and that was a mistake I could not uh, rescue the piece from, so I had to start again. So it depends on the mistake. That mistake was leaving stuff on the floor. <laughs> This is my workout, by the way. <laughs> See, babe, I'm exercising. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, could you ask what your day looks like? Or are you just cutting for 12 hours a day? No. <laughs> no. No. Uh, uh, well, the thing about paper cutting is you can't do it too many hours in succession because then you kind of get up like a crippled old lady. It's, it's hard on the body to do any type of work too much. So, um, but. My typical day is uh, I, I get up about 6.30 in the morning and do yoga. Uh, and while I'm having breakfast, I uh, write in my journal. Um, and then I try and get into my studio at, at about 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning and figure out what I have to do for the day. And, and sometimes it's making work, but there's also, um, like, I... I set a lot of goals to keep me on track around a lot of stuff because I am, you know, my studio is in my home, so it's easy to let things slide. So I, you know, I have things around like writing a certain amount of blog posts every month or, um, you know, like maintaining, I have a Facebook page, so posting to my Facebook page or posting things to Twitter, you know, these are all things you have to maintain. Um, or if I'm working on proposals for, um, commissions or um, upcoming shows. It, it all it all depends. Like there's a whole mix of things. It's not all just like sitting in the studio making art. I wish it was. Speaking of your social media activity, your Instagram handle is just Rachel Ash, just like your yeah. Handle, there's right? an underscore. Ra is Rachel, it Rachel underscore Ash? Yes. Yeah. And you should all be following her right now. <laughs> it's a really good Instagram feed. Uh, when it's not filled with pictures of my dog. Okay, my boss dog. I have a question I, I meant to ask before, but that's okay. You talked about, you have, ta one, of, one of the things I really appreciate about what you've said to us today, and I personally can relate to, is that you had to leave some sort of, <sighs> something you put a lot of time to learn in, that was in the analog space, right, the, the film, behind. To, to, and now you're in this, like, there's this journey, the Rachel Ash artistic, you know, trajectory. What's... It's more like this. Sure. But it's also becoming more and more techy. You, you, maybe that's osmosis through hanging out with, with Boris, but you're, like, dabbling in things like laser etching now, right? Like, what is, is that part of what, what's coming for you? Are you going to do more of this later? Because you can do that. Isn't that a laser etch? That's, that picture right there? Wasn't that laser cut? No, that's him. That's handcut. Holy crap, you're crazy. <laughs> anyway, but I, you, the piece, there's a piece, what restaurant is it in again? Ernest Ice Cream. Ernest Ice Cream. Ernest Ice Cream. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, so, this, this is a laser cut of uh, one of my paper cuts. So, sorry, can you just summarize the question? <laughs> Where are you going? Uh, sorry. What's next? Where are you going? Why do you experiment with this sort of stuff? Um, well, with the paperwork, uh, there's a lot of stuff that I want to do with it, but it's sort of, it's too delicate in some ways to, um, so a lot of people love the work, but they're, they're concerned about it being too delicate uh, to deal with as an art object. So, um, I started exploring laser cutting, and I'm not doing this myself, by the way. Um, because of the laser cutter cafe that was in Chinatown over the summer. And so I had been thinking about laser cutting quite a bit, but when that was there, it's like, okay, this is the opportunity to finally do this. And I was just curious to see how the paper cutting work would translate into other materials so that it would make it more durable. And I still want to start this with this handmade process, and to me, it, it's a handmade process all the way through because the digital part of it uh, is a lot of hands-on work still even though it involves the computer because it's taking the paper cut, scanning it, oftentimes piecing it together because it's too large to fit in the scanner, 
cleaning up in Photoshop, and then essentially I have to draw the thing again in Illustrator because there's no quick way to generate a good file for the laser cutter to work with. And the laser cutter actually works with uh, SVG vector files. And then it takes over, but, uh, you know, I, I emphasize hands-on making, but digital tools are important to have be knowledgeable about for artists. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you need to know as an artist, and you need to be able to market yourself, so it helps to know how to use social media and be comfortable with it, and and also just to understand technology as a whole. Like, Do you plan on experimenting with 3D printing at some point? Uh, possibly. Um, I don't like that 3D printing is plastic. I, I'd like to keep using... Like, this is bamboo plywood, so it's a sustainable material. So I feel comfortable moving the paper into that material. Uh, Richard of Hemlock Printing mentioned that there's 3D printers working in paper, so that kind of intrigues me. But I, I don't maybe know they, about Maybe that. they can be your, um, what's that called? Patron. Patron. <laughs> Rachel Ash, sponsored by Hemlock. Right? You drive around in a car. With logos on the side, paper flying out the back. <laughs> awesome. Isn't that really awesome? I, I get credit for that idea. <laughs> Anybody else have some, some questions as we wrap up? There's one. Hi, Rachel. Hello. When we were talking in our small group earlier, and I apologize, I did duck out for the first question, so if I'm making you repeat yourself, uh, I do apologize. Um, one thing that really struck me was um, talking when you were talking about your client collaborations and how they really allowed you to stretch in ways that you hadn't really anticipated wanting to stretch, but um, you could see the opportunity in them and you could see that they were good things to say yes to. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what the, what, you know, what gave you the trust um, or what helped you build the trust with the people that you were working with so that you felt that you could, um, you know, be upfront about the fact that you were stretching yourself but still um, sort of marshal yourself to a positive result? Well, I don't do a lot of client work, um, but you're, the way you've described it as a collaboration, that is exactly how I approach it. Um, and for me, you know, if I don't know how to do something, I'm pretty upfront about it. Uh, so I tell the client, you know, I've never done this before, but I'm pretty sure I can do it. Uh, and I think, I don't know if you can do that normally, like if you're a designer or something working with clients, if you can admit the lack of knowledge. So, but for me, I'm okay with doing that uh, because I know I'm not going to try and trick the client and then kind of totally screw it up. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that I've had people approach me because they're interested in what I'm doing and, and ask me to do these opportunities. Yeah, it's, it's really great. And I hope more stuff like that comes my way. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I just noticed that we're running out of time. And one of our um, promises to you folks is to get you back you're all taking a time out from your work day, so we're going to wrap up now so you can get to work. Thank you very, very much.